Hello there and welcome to part 2 of Air, Water and Weather. So in the previous part of the chapter, we looked at the air, we took, looked at the components of air, we saw about atmosphere, we spoke about atmospheric pollution. So in today's session, we will be focusing completely on water. So let's see water. Now if we see water, we know that three quarters of the earth is covered by water and only about a little more than 25% is made up of the land masses. The rest of it is all water. So if you see these sources of water, what do you think could be the sources of water? These oceans, lakes, rivers, underground water as well as sky, water is present. So in sky, water is present as water vapor. We also know that all living beings depend on water. So in some way or another, living beings depend on water. And without water, there can be no life on earth that could survive. If you take the simple example of blood, the blood that pumps in our body, which carries oxygen and food to different parts of our body, is majorly made up of water. So we know how important water is. So when we know so much about water, we also know that water dissolves many things. So what is this? If we take a spoon, if we take a spoon of salt or sugar, this is salt or sugar and we're putting it into a glass of water here. After some time, we will see that it disappears. Okay. It disappears or dissolves into water to give you a salt solution. Right. So you have salt here. So this salt, we will call it as the solute. And the solution that is water is called the solvent. Okay. Water is called the solvent. Salt or sugar that you add is called the solute. And finally, when they disperse together or dissolve together, they form what is called as the solution. So if you see here, all the salt that you're adding into water completely dissolves and becomes one to give you a salt solution. Substances that dissolve in water are said to be soluble in water. For this, you have your examples such as salt, you have your sugar, which are all soluble in water. So what do you think could be insoluble in water? If you see this example here, you have water. Okay, so if you notice here, we have three different layers which are standing apart. So you have water in the center, you have sand in the end and you have oil right on top. If you can see, this is not merging with each other to give you one single solution. They are all standing separately as three different layers. You have oil right at the top, you have water which is not mixing with oil and you also have sand which is settled right at the bottom. You don't see a solution being formed. So substances which do not dissolve in water are said to be insoluble in water. So these are about soluble and insoluble. Let's look at impurities. Now we know very well that no water on earth is completely pure. So what are the impurities? When water comes down as rain, it generally comes in contact with soil and rocks and picks up many different types of minerals and salts which are soluble in water. Apart from these soluble things, it also picks up certain insoluble things. So this is nothing but sand and you have rock. Apart from soluble materials, rain also picks up certain insoluble materials. So what are the insoluble substances here? We're talking about sand and rock. So these are all natural impurities which are present in water. What about impurities brought into water by man? Now, if you can see these two pictures, they clearly indicate how man is bringing in impurities into water. The picture here depicts how industries are putting in all their wastes into water. On the other hand, this picture represents how residential wastes are thrown into the water body nearby. So this is nothing but many soluble and insoluble impurities introduced by industrial and residential wastes. In other words, they are simply brought into water by man. Now we spoke about so many different types of impurities. So when we know that there are impurities present in water, we must also talk about removal of these impurities. So in these, we will talk about removal of soluble impurities and we will talk about removal of insoluble impurities. Let's first start with removal of insoluble impurities by sedimentation and decantation and the other one is through filtration. So we will see sedimentation and decantation first. If you see this diagrammatic representation, let's look at the 
first glass that we have. So we have one glass of clear water which is not contaminated. We'll take a spoonful of mud and we will mix it into this. Okay, so this spoonful of mud we're going to add to clean water. Stir it nicely. Now once we stir what happens, we get a solution that is muddy water. So mud mixes with water and you will get muddy water. So this muddy water, we're going to leave it undisturbed for 10 minutes. What do you mean by undisturbed? We're not going to shake it, move it, nothing. However we leave it, we're going to leave it as it is for the next 10 minutes. Now once 10 minutes are over, you will notice that all the mud particles that we added will all settle at the bottom. And you will get a clearer solution right on top. So if you can see this picture here, all the mud is settled here. You can see that mud is settled here, whereas all the clear water settles on top. So this process is called as sedimentation. That is, now once this happens, we will gently transfer whatever clear solution is there to a fresh glass. Okay, we're going to pour out all this clear solution into a fresh glass. This process is called as decantation because we are decanting the layer of solution that is clear. So this process is called as decantation. Now at the end of decantation, you have one glass which has the sediment, which is all the waste materials which have settled down. And the other one will have the clear water which you have decanted into a fresh glass. So this process is called as sedimentation and decantation. The other method that is used is called as filtration. Now, the simplest and the most crude way of doing filtration is when you have one clear glass or a clean glass, which you will cover it with a cotton cloth. And then whatever mixture that you have, you pour onto this cotton cloth. So what the cotton cloth does is it will hold back or it will filter all the dust and the mud particles and allow only clean water to pass in. Okay, so all this dirty water you're pouring onto the cotton cloth and only clean water is going to pass through the cotton cloth and settle into the fresh glass. In your experiments, what do we do? We use what is called as a filter paper. Now this is a filter paper that we have here. Now filter paper is generally circular. So what you will do is you will fold it in half and then you will fold it into a quarter again like they've shown in this diagram. And when you open it out, you'll end up with a cone which looks like this. So if you have to see how it looks for real, this is how it looks in the image below. So when you fold it, you will end up with a cone that looks like this. This filter paper is very opaque. You can't see through it. Whereas through a cotton cloth, you can see through it, right? That's because the holes in the filter paper are a lot more tinier than the holes in the cotton cloth, which means whatever water you're filtering through the filter paper is a lot more cleaner than the water that you filter through cotton. Let's see how this is done. So you have a funnel here. You fix this cone-like filter paper into the funnel and you have a collecting beaker or a conical flask below the funnel. You can pour in all the dirty muddy water and this filter paper will take care of the job of cleaning it and it will allow only clear water or clean water to pass down which gets collected here. So you can see here clean water is getting collected down in the beaker. So this process is called as filtration. Okay, this is the process of filtration. Now let's look at how to remove soluble impurities. So we've seen how to remove insoluble impurities. Let's see how we can remove soluble impurities. This is done by evaporation and condensation. So if we take a shallow dish like this, we fill it up with water, allow it to boil. So you're giving heat from below because of which water is going to boil and evaporate. We will take a very cold steel plate and keep it on top of this so that whatever steam is coming up, whatever water vapors come up, they will form small water droplets on this. Now this is nothing but very very clean water. So the method of removal of soluble impurities by evaporation followed by condensation is called as distillation. Now let's look at how a distillation setup looks like. Now if you see this distillation setup, it has two main steps. The first step is water is evaporated in a distillation flask by heating. That is what you're seeing here. So this is step one where you have heat coming from below and this is your distillation flask. You're allowing the water to start to evaporate. You're going to allow water to evaporate because of the heat given from below. So in step two, if you observe, this is step two. 
water vapor is collected in another flask this flask is called the condenser and the condenser is kept cool by continuous circulation of cold water now if you see water collected in this way is the purest form of water and it is called as distilled water now this distilled water cannot be used for drinking because we need certain minerals to be present in water for it to be fit for drinking but where is distilled water used it is used in scientific laboratories as well as in car batteries so this is where we find the uses of distilled water now what about drinking water now how do we treat drinking water at home we do it very simply we simply boil it to 15 to 20 minutes and then we filter it now this is at a home level what about the water works the town water supply uses water from rivers and lakes which means they have allied sources from which they pick up water now you know that from lakes and rivers the water is not going to be very clean they have to purify water at water works to make it safe for drinking so let's see what all they follow to purify water. The first process that they use is sedimentation. We already saw what sedimentation was. They have very large sedimentation tanks in which they allow water to stand. Okay, so they leave water undisturbed so that all the heavy insoluble materials will all settle below. And finally, whatever clear water settles on top is sent for the next process. What is the next process? They do filtration, which is the next process. So in filtration, what they do is this clear water that they get from sedimentation, they're going to pour it on sand beds. Now, what are sand beds? Instead of using filter paper, they are using sand beds, which is on a larger scale. Now, sand bed is going to act just like filter paper and hold back all the smaller impurities in water. Okay, so once this does, you're going to get a lot more cleaner water. Finally, to the clean water, what do they add? They add a very small amount of chlorine, which is called as chlorination. To clean water that they get from filtration, they're going to add chlorine. This process is called as chlorination. So the three processes followed by the waterworks is sedimentation, filtration and chlorination. Okay, so this completes part two of chapter. Now let's see what all we covered under part 2. We did water. We saw how water dissolves many things and why it is called a solvent. We saw how different impurities are brought into water. What are the different kinds of impurities? We saw how to remove impurities. In that we saw removal of insoluble impurities through sedimentation and decantation and filtration. We saw removal of soluble impurities through distillation. And finally, we saw how drinking water was processed at home as well as by the waterworks. So this completes this part of the chapter. If you have any doubts, please comment below. Please like, subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you.